Hello everyone, um, I'm Mike Hart, uh, Arrowview Schools and Colleges Manager. Um, I'm joined today by Phil Beaumont, who's um, Head of Rugby at Northampton School for Boys. Um, hi Phil, you alright mate? Good to see you. Yeah, thanks buddy. So the uh, the whole idea of the webinar today, as you've seen there, is just to just have a look at the outline of, of the rugby programme at Northampton School. Um, let's have a conversation around the successes and challenges you've had. Um, and how you've really just kickstarted rugby and then actually what we can learn from the pandemic, if that's all right. And then we can hopefully share that out to, to other schools in the area and obviously just, just share good practice. Definitely, we've had lots of positives. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, it's been it's been a crazy, very bizarre year. Um, challenging for most. Um, you know, we've been two lockdowns. We've got a rugby roadmap to get us back to playing again. We've been up and down that roadmap from C to D, back to probably C plus again a little bit. And of course, now we've hit stage E. So we're at, we're at an adapted version of the game. Could you tell us in terms of from, from September, really, what does your programme look like? So I think like most state schools, um, we had a very controlled start with no clubs, getting the students back in into lessons. Um, and we then looked from the RFU guidance and we put it back on for PE lessons. Right. So PE lessons followed the roadmap and did the non-contact version of the game um, across year seven to year nine. So introducing some players that had never played before to PE lessons there. Um, and again, keeping it non-contact actually engaged more. And we found the transfer when we were able to put clubs back in place suddenly meant that we ended up with a bigger uptake than we've ever had at year seven rugby. Um, because they knew they were coming to a non-contact rugby game, which they were familiar with from P lessons. So that was really positive. Um, P lessons have continued. Um, we're still not doing contact, even though we're in stage E in PE, um, yeah. because we felt that's worked really well. Um, and because of the disparity of some players that played before and some haven't, um, we've kept it as the rugby for ready version and different touch games version. So we've done lots of gamification in PE, um, which has been great, and lots of games for understanding. Um, and then broken it down to having small segments of skill zones as such. Um, yeah, yeah. But for yeah. the whole group, split into a bit of skill zone, but then going back into more game-based scenarios. So whole part, whole game, game-based scenarios. So P lessons have been great. On the club side, um, we started gradually, we wanted to get the year sevens engaged first. So we harnessed that enthusiasm that they have for sport um, and therefore pushed them through. And as I said, we had 80 boys suddenly come out rugby training um, as a, not a trial but on our first sessions and we've maintained that still having 60 as of last night. Um, to put that into context we have we have 200 boys um, we don't have games afternoons and it's optional and after school um, so with the lockdowns being in place during lockdown two especially there was no clubs on um, so to retain that after four weeks off has been great um, and I think that's down to probably again a better introduction to rugby for most with it being non-contact based, more game based and looking at them understanding the game and building that sort of scenario. When we move that higher up, we week by week introduced an extra year group into our programme before we were back in October half term yeah. to what looked something that was more similar. Um, the issues there are around the whole of extracurricular for us has been changing rooms has been the big issue in spaces. Um, we're restrained like all state schools in their year group bubbles um, and therefore haven't been able to have mixed bubbles at seniors. Um, so normally our senior setup would be some year 11s, year 12 and 13 combined. Um, but actually it's this year it's been under 18s, under 17s, under 16s, um, but they all need their own changing rooms. So what that's meant is we have, rather than training twice a week and playing on a Saturday, that's meant to training once a week um, for each year group so they could get a space. But what that also meant is because there's less training slots and just as many coaches, we've changed our coaching scenario. So we're in a situation where actually coaches now move from different age groups. So the quality of that session, um, yeah. because it's less, has ended up with more coaches there, higher quality sessions, um, and really focused on the core skills and pulling out the detail. Um, so that's been a real positive for us that the change rooms were the issue less time actually out on the pitch from two sessions to one session a week but more coaches per session um, and therefore hearing different voices and being able to therefore have a bit more structure on your ratios with therefore allowing what you're doing um, and that meant we managed to push as a school more of a game zone skill zone and pulling a group out taking off to do some skill work um, which which worked really well since lockdown two um, we've 
gone on and started to go to stage D where we could look contact. Before that, we were all rugby ready based um, with a no contact as a school motto, just to make sure that we were staying in the guidance and we, we were able to. Yeah, sorry. Now I was going to say, could I jump in there actually? In yeah, terms exactly. of, about because you mentioned about ready for rugby, um, and I know you use the terminology hole part hole, which me and you all know. Yeah. Uh, and then you've gone into get so game zone, skill zone, of course, is what we're using across our in your rugby coaching coaching suites anyway. Yeah. Which is that same thing and stuff. So that's the model you've used as it is. How was how has ready for rugby helped the players then? Have you had what feedback have you had from the players around that? Um they found it a fast flowing game. Um they found it really enjoyable because there's lots of success um breaking the game line and scoring tries. Very quick for them to learn to pick up. Um because we've been adapted it slightly we found as they were starting to learn to play it, the structure started to disappear at times. Um, yeah. So we slowed the game down um, for, for the players and probably the coaching staff to start with the refereeing. Um, and what we did is we did the, your version of the pressure zone where on the second touch, they had to hit the deck rather than throw the ball in the air. And that just allowed a bit more time for the players to restructure their support um, and have a little bit more organisation and the coaches to make sure they could see that players were going back far enough um, and then, it just fast, doesn't it? It does get, it just, yeah. yeah. It does go fast. And as they've become, as the older age groups, and as they've got better at it, we've gone back to changing it in certain areas, such as the pressure zone, you can throw the ball back in the air and play. Um, so each coach has manipulated slightly to suit their their age group and their players. Um, so that's that's worked really well for us, and they've, they've enjoyed playing it. And again, we've normally had three teams, and another coach has taken a group out while two groups are playing and then worked on a rotation so you can have better quality on the technical aspects when that's, you're doing your field. And that's what you mean, that's what you meant by gamification. You've used those, those adaptations within, is it? Do you want to yeah, so, um, a little bit about that? So yeah, with gamifying it, we've not only done points for scoring, for scoring for tries, we've done um, different points for certain players, if they score a, a try, they can pick someone on their team, suddenly gets double points. Um, we've done a situation if they've managed to um, have one player pass the ball before contact, um, they suddenly get an extra point. We've had a look at times bringing the kick in, um, and if they used a kick and to be score from it, again, we've looked at that idea of mixing up with the double points, etc. Um, and then we've talked about within two minutes, in a two-minute scenario, wherever you finish on the pitch, territory-wise, that's there for whether your team's winning and it gets bonus points or not, and had t really short time segments. So um, just been varying, really, the point systems to keep the players interested um, and manipulating it to make them think about solving problems and different scenarios. That's fab. And then, of course, a lot of people will be asking, actually, it's great that you've got lots of staff and and, and uh, coaches to help you with that session and stuff, but you um, you actually go external as well to bring people in, don't you? It's not just the PE staff that are helping you. Yeah, out. so we we have to use, all our, our guys that basically work as volunteers um, and we use the support of the community. Um, so we work hard of bringing in other community coaches um, from the local clubs um, to try and build good club links. And we've done that for a couple of years now. We've been really successful with it um, and look at employing them as volunteers to come and support with our rugby programme. Um, and therefore, they would have an assistant coach in that scenario with one of the members of staff. Um, we've also got some parents that have, have children that have rugby experience that then come back and offer their time that way. Um, and we have a few old boys, um, such as what is a gap student as such, or a graduate sports um, person, but coming in voluntarily um, and giving a little bit back to the rugby programme. With the idea, like you said, of not having staff at the minute, we I've spoken to all our staff and said, well, we're not having Saturday fixtures, we're not having fixtures. Can you help out the programme generically and come and give you time to another age group? Um, yeah. So that doubling up of staffs worked really well. Um, and again, it's just using the resources you have available to you um, and trying to think a little bit outside the box because we only have three PE staff but are rugby specialists. Uh, and we're fortunate because we're an all boys school. But again, we're split across all sports. So with only three staff there and to run all age groups, um, it doesn't work unless you try and think of different systems and then go through the correct protocol with senior staff to get them signed off safeguarded and ready to be able to come out and coach. So it takes some time. You can't do it yeah. overnight, um, but it's a long term goal that's been really successful for us. Yeah, so it's taken a few years to build that. Was it you that broached that club relationship or those club um, links or is it two way? And how, how is it maintained now? So we I go across and speak to the Colts. So focusing on the senior section, yeah. um, we've always wanted to make sure there's never a clash 
Um, and Colts fixtures for the local clubs for us happen on a Saturday afternoon and school fixtures are Saturday. So we never want to be in a situation where the local club is suffering because we're taking their players uh, and we don't want to be in a situation where the feelings felt the other way around either. Um, so we have good conversations and between us, we you could say we run three teams. Um, that The first team for the school is the first team and then there's a pool of players, um, depending on the week, of where it's going to be the higher quality game. Is it going to be the second 15 game? Is it that they've got a cup game and therefore we relinquish players for them? Um, yeah. Or is it that they've got another local friendly game and what players do they need? If we've got two tens and they haven't got a 10 and they already play for a local club, it makes sense for them to go back and play. Um, so we, it, this year's different because there are no cup competitions and the fixtures are about, for us, participation and retention of people for future years and players developing. Um, so we'll all make sure that everyone can get a team out. But in previous years, it's been, well, which game's been the highest level, which one's the most important, and we've targeted games and we sit down at the start of the year and say, I'd like to be able to take the pick of the players in this week, but I'm happy for you in your National Cup run or your County Cup to have who you need then. Um, and that little bit of compromise has gone a long way and bit fostered into a relationship now. With COVID, I talked about changing rooms being an issue. We're now going to the local rugby club um, using their changing rooms um, kindly and using their pitches um, for two of our age groups because otherwise they wouldn't be able to get out and actually have any sessions at all. So the links, the links fostered itself to WhatsApp conversations weekly, sometimes daily, um, but just good conversations and probably meeting formally once a month and just checking in and making sure it works and yeah. how we can help each other. Um, and this year, especially with we're finding now with fixtures with the tier three issues, um, and we've just had some good conversations that our lower ages are going to go and play some or looking to play against the local club. Um, so the school are going to play against the club and it works. Travel, there's no travel. They can arrive in kit, they can leave in kit. Um, yeah. And there's people playing again, which is what, what we're trying to get is as many boys out playing as possible. So um, I, was, I was actually going to, that was the next question. So you've, you've led into it nicely, actually. It was actually, what are you going to do or have you done ready for probably post Christmas to retain players? Because I know they're chomping at the bit to play games, aren't they? That's why we that's why we train. We want, we want to play some games. And I know Tier 3 Challenge is going to be in there. So you've actually gone local, have you? Yeah, so we have we had a full fixture card planned um, all the way up to Easter for 15s. We made a decision, as we talked about, that we want everyone playing as much as possible. So we stayed on 15 aside to get more boys out on the pitch. Um, and we had a weekly fixture card ready to go for that. Um, with the Tier 3 issues, which was announced by Boris, that therefore meant we're not travelling into those areas. Um, and some headmasters and headmistresses, I suppose, are in a situation where they're a little bit more restrained in what they're allowing their departments to do. Um, so some have travel restrictions on how far they can travel. Um, we've been fortunate that our headmaster's supportive within the guidelines um, and allowing us to go on away fixtures. Um, as long as we maintain the security of our year group bubbles, um, the same as we are in training, um, which means we're having a look at changing our travel systems from big coaches, so to now minibuses, um, yeah. to keep our bubbles safer and more secure. Um, and then we're going to look to not go to their two tier three games, but fill in the gaps that we can't play with playing the local rugby club. Um, we've looked to go and play some representative rugby, so we're going to play a fixture against our local representative side at a senior level um, as well. And then also it's going to allow the opportunity to open and put in good conversations with other local schools that are finding the same problems, that there's holes in their fixture card and how we can get boys playing and as many boys as possible. Um, so it's those sort of conversations we can try and do. We've looked at triangulars um, just to try and support some rugby. Um, we've got a couple of those planned for post-February half term as well. Right, no, that's, that's great. So you mentioned about head teachers, and, and I know a lot of people. I mean, how have you gone about selling this to the SLT? Has it been has it been a challenge, or you know, and so on? What, what tips would you give to people to actually make sure we we can kickstart and get rugby playing again? So I think um, the RFU have been useful with producing some good documents, especially going into stage E and the return to play. Um, I've taken those out, handed them over to my line manager. Um, we've summarised them together and had good conversations and meetings about them of, well, what can rugby look like? What's it going to look like with changing rooms? What's it going to look like with playing games? 
how does the transport work? We've summarised the document and then we've uh, spoken to the head and gone, this is what we want to do for rugby. It's different to the FA, ESFA for football. Um, it's different to water polo, but we've got some really clear framework of this is what it looks like for us to play our games. And it's not that far off what our logistics programme is for actually um, playing rugby. We're looking at things like close site uh, for spectators um, just to limit that, even though the RFU are saying it can be room for all six for depending on your tier group that you're in, um, just to try and have some consistency across sports. Yeah. Um, and again, looking at making sure that as long as we can secure our bubble and know that we have those safety measures in place from our risk assessments, um, putting those in place and following through. So it's, it's been using the RFU guidance as a tool to have those conversations and be proactive um, using it and actually say, this guidance is now released. What are we able to do and have that as a resource that you can justify your suggestions with? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's spot on. I'm just thinking just to, just to wrap this up, actually, um, not to put you on the spot or anything. Um, what would be your top two? Your top two tips, really, to, to put out there, actually, to help people to, to get rugby started again? Um, lower lower down the school. Um, we've had the best retention ever, and that's come about from not doing contact too early um, and then actually tiering your groups to gradually introduce contact in. So I think for this time, for our year sevens, we're going to look at um, having the contact version of a game with our A teams. Um, but our C, our B, C team, we'll look at probably maybe depending on the schools we're playing and where they're at have a conversation about whether we'll play ready for rugby um and that's right. doing that. so keeping that game zone playing keeping yeah. the non-contact version of the game playing allowed more people to stay involved um quicker rather than finding a dropout where potentially we've got it wrong in the past and forced it and encouraged it a little bit too early and found that there's a little bit, a little bit of a dropout so um definitely missed talent previously from there secondly it's talk to the coaches coaches want to we all do it for the right reasons we want people playing we want yeah. to see the bad guys back on the pitch so actually ask us to look about what we've done previously and adapt what we're doing and it's again look at how we can be flexible and adaptable use the assets that you've got um and change the mindset of i always do the under 14s or that's my team and go to a bigger picture of we're trying to support as many guys playing rugby as possible um and a final tip number three is speak to the local rugby clubs um, they're in the same position as us, but from a club angle and a community angle rather than a school angle. So there are local teams available that want to play outside of school hours um, where headmasters currently are tight on academics and re re reluctant to relinquish players out of lesson time. Um, but those Saturday fixtures are available for the clubs. It's just looking at things a little bit differently in yeah. these strange times. and trying to put new solutions in that could work um, that will probably carry forward from moving forward anyway. That's that's great. I think that's really, really positive to see that actually, yeah, from a pandemic, we've ended up with a format of the game that actually can help schools and actually retain players, bring players in and actually just build their confidence to to, to build that lifelong love of the game. Actually, then we're all in it together, aren't we? So I appreciate it. Well, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it, Phil. Um, well, thank you, Mike. Appreciate talking to you. Pleasure.